city and in the territory on west, there is just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, and the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job, and it makes a man watchful and a little lonely. I'd thank you just to tell me if you could fix it. You fought for the rebels, didn't you? I'm proud I fought on the side of honor. Yeah, yeah sure. I can always tell by the gun. You know? A piece like this, that's a, a copy of a Navy Colt. About all you rebels could get sometimes. Can you fix it? Can you put it in firing shape? No, that's a very old gun. If you can't fix it, hand it back. I've not no, time to no, wait. No, no, hold on your horses, mister. I, I can fix it all right. Well, when can I have it? I could even fix this so that we'll fire metal cartridges. You, you could even use 38. All right, just so it'll but, work. But I don't see no sense to it. How long will it take? No, there is no sense to it, mister. You, you are wearing a much better gun right now. There, there's nothing can be those new cold peacemaker. I have a special job for this gun. But it can't be nothing that the new forty-five can do. This gun missed its chance once. I'm going to see it doesn't miss it again. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I know what you mean, Miss. You just fix the gun. When it's in firing shape, bring it to me at the Dodge House. <laughs> Storekeeper? Storekeeper? Just a minute, mister. I'm not accustomed to being kept waiting. I said just a minute. I don't see how you can keep your business going if you're not here to wait on customers. Well, I no use getting riled, mister. I've got a lot of things to do back there in the storeroom. Folks in Dodge know I'm here. They know I'll wait on them as soon as I can. No way to run a business. You want something and you just come in here to talk. I want a coffin. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that, mister. I don't require sympathy, just a coffin. Well, all right. How much do you want to pay? I don't care how much I pay. I want the right one. Well, I don't carry many fine caskets, mister. Not much call for them out here. I want a box like the North used during the war between the states. An army coffin? I ain't never carried nothing that cheap in my whole store. Have one made up then. Well, I might be able to do that. I want one just like the one they buried the Yankees in. Oh, is this going to be a military funeral? Not exactly. I mean, was the deceased a soldier? He was a soldier once. He should have died a soldier. Well, now, it don't make much difference what kind of coffin a man's buried in. And now, what I got back he here... He won't read anything better than a Yankee coffin or a Yankee death. My name is Yancey Grote. I'd like some information. All right, sure, Mr. Grote. Be glad to tell you just about anything you might like to know. My name's Chester Proud. I want to bury him. Oh, my gracious, Mr. Grote. That's a shame. And I want a preacher to read the service. Sure you do. It's only fitting. It's a funny thing, though. What? Well, I can't recollect anybody around these parts who's died recently. That doesn't matter. 
Well, now, Mr. Grote, begging your pardon, but it might matter a good deal. All I want is the name of a man to read the service. Well, now, uh, that's just it. Some folks would want one kind of a bearing, and some folks would want another. The folks around here who call for a preacher seem to like to be spoke over or sung over. But just give me a name. They either like a lot of words telling what a fine fellow there was, or they like to be sung away, gentle-like. Is the... <laughs> the body here in Dodge? Not yet. Oh. Being freighted in, is he? No. He's riding in. Beginning to live like a normal man. What change? Oh, how's that? Well, you've been staying around town, not riding off all over the countryside. You've even taken time to eat most of your meals sitting at the table. Yeah, and I've let out a notch in my belt, too. You look fine, Matt. Oh, thank you, Kitty, but just so it doesn't go too far. What do you mean? That'd be a fine thing if I got up one morning and couldn't buckle my gun on, wouldn't it? Be all right with me. Kitty, it's because it's been quiet lately. There you are, Mr. Dillon. I declare I've been looking all I knew it for you. Last. What is it, Chester? Uh, excuse me, Miss Kitty. Sure, Chester. Well, Mr. Dillon, it ain't exactly trouble. <laughs> it's it's more amusing, like. Oh, well, what's the story? Well, I guess it ain't a story exactly neither. Well, for heaven's sake, Chester, say it out, whatever it is. Uh, well, it's about that fella I met out on the street. What fella, Chester? Name of Grove, I think it was. Yancey Grove? Why, yes, ma'am. You know him, Miss Kitty? I've heard about him. Well, I tell you, it, it was real comical. <laughs> he came up to me. <laughs> uh, Chester, what did he come up to you about? <laughs> well, that's just it. He, he, he came up to ask about getting a preacher for a burying. <laughs> What's so funny about that? <laughs> Don't you see, Mr. Dillon? He's getting pretty far ahead of himself. He wanted this preacher to bury a man who ain't even dead yet. He ain't even in town. Well, is he sick? <laughs> no, sir, he ain't sick. He's riding into Dodge as fine as can be. Miss Grove says he knows he'll be needing a preacher when he gets here. Now, don't that beat all? Matt. Yeah, what is it? It kid? may not be so funny. You mean you know something about this? I've been hearing strange things about Yancey Grove. Well, what kind of things? Well, old Walt Dow was in here the other night. Well, did he sell Grote a gun? No, not exactly. But he was telling the boys at the bar about how this stranger wanted him to fix up an old Confederate pistol. The man wanted to use it to even an old score. And the man was Grote, huh? That's right. And then today, Jonas came in with a strange tale about him, too. It seems he was pricing coffins. Yeah. Chester, hmm? you know where I can find him? Well, he's over at the Dodge house, Mr. Dillon. He told me to have the preacher come there. Well, I think maybe I'd better get over there first. <laughs> You, uh, got somebody registered here by the name of Grote? Why, yes, we do. Yancey Grote, Southern gentleman. Uh-huh. Is he in his room now? Well, now, Marshal, I don't keep track of all the guests. Which room is his, Toby? Uh, second from the top of the stairs. Thank you. U.S. Marshal. Open up. 
Come in, Marshal. Come in. Thank you. Let me get those rags off that chair so you can sit down. Oh, never mind. It's all right. I've been polishing my gun. Oh? Is uh, that the one that Walt Dow fixed up for you? You know about that? Well, half a Dodge knows about it. The old man talks a lot. Now, you have to admit, though, it was no ordinary job. Fixing an old, worn-out gun. No, I suppose not. Dow does nice work. You, you care to take a look at it here, Marshal? Got the action nice and easy. Yeah, it works fine. Uh, Dow seemed to feel that uh, you had a special plan for this gun. Oh, I do, Marshal, I do. Maybe you better tell me about it, huh? Why, I'm going to use it to kill a man. Oh? Well, who is he? I don't think you know him, Marshal. But not that it make any difference. He isn't here yet. What's his name? His name's Tom Haskett. He'll be here in a few days. He's coming with a herd of cattle. And I'll be waiting. I've been waiting for too many years already. You listen to me, Grodin. No, Marshal, you listen to me. There's nothing you can say to stop me. There's nothing you can do that'll save Haskett's life. I saved it once myself. And it was the biggest mistake I ever made. You're sure trying to make a bigger one. I know you're doing your duty as a lawman, but I'm here to do my duty, too. And I'm going to finish something I should have finished at Manassas. Those folks are doing their best to forget about the war, Grant. I had him there lying wounded at my feet. A Yankee soldier. I had this gun in my hand. I should have finished him. I should have finished him right there. It's no crime to let a man live. Two years later, he was with Sherman in Georgia. Tom Haskett led his men to burning my home. My wife was killed trying to escape. I should have finished him. And I will. I can't blame you for your feelings, Groat, but... Uh... Killing isn't going to bring anything back. Your wife will still be dead and you'll have a murder on your hands. This won't be murder, Marshal. Merely delayed justice. The court won't see it that way. There's no law in the land can stop me. I've been trailing Tom Haskett for years and now i found him. And I'm going to kill him. Grote, maybe you can't help it if the bitterness in your brain is eating away the reason, but let me tell you something. You're not going to work out your revenge and dodge... As soon as I hear that that cattle drive is near town, I'm going to lock you up. And I'm going to keep you locked up till Haskett's safely out of town. You can't stop me, Marshal. I hope I won't have to, Groats. I hope maybe you'll stop yourself. You know, Matt, it isn't the grudge that's causing the trouble. Oh, what do you mean, Doc? Well, lots of folks carry grudges. And some of them never get rid of them as long as they live. Well, Yancey Groat's sure never going to get rid of his. I know. And if you just stop and think about half of this whole country is carrying a grudge, it'll never get over either about the war. Yeah, I guess you're right, Doc. Mm -hmm. The trouble comes when folks can't control themselves about whatever's eating at them. When they're so riled up, they have to hurt or shoot or kill to, to get it out of their system. I like growth. Now, I'll tell you something else, man. You may be able to lock him up or chase him out of town, keep him from doing any killing this time, but it won't stop him in the long run. He's the kind that won't let himself be stopped. Ever. Maybe so, Doc, but I sure got to try. Of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes Chester. Looking hungry. Well, he hasn't eaten for at least an hour and a half. Of course he's hungry. Well, uh, hold on, Mr. Dillon. Doc. Uh, uh, Chester, come on, sit down. Have your dinner, Bart. Uh, thank you. I could show you something, that's a fact. Uh, it's a wonder to me you had the strength to get here, Chester. It must be at least five minutes after noon already. Well, I would have been here sooner. You can count on that, but I was held up at the corner by Mr. Dolby. Oh, well, what's on his mind? It's about that groat fellow, Mr. Dillon. I swear he just about makes as little sense as anybody I ever run into. What's he done now? Well, it ain't that he's done nothing. It's what he ain't done that makes you wonder. What? Well, you know how he was going around town making all kinds of arrangements for a burying. Yeah, go on. 
Wilson. He's left town. Left town? Are you sure? Mr. Doby says he packed out early this morning, cleaned out his room, and rode off. Well, does Doby know where he went? No, we don't, Mr. Dillon. Moss Grimmick does. Oh, come on, Chester. Get it out. Uh, well, Moss Grimmick saddled his horse for him, and Groat was asking which way the cattle drive would be coming from. Yeah, what do you have, Chester? Well, no. Bring him something to eat in a hurry. Well, no, I ain't in no special rush. Yes, you are, Chester. Meet me at the stable in five minutes. We're going to be riding south. <laughs> Cook for this outfit, mister? Well, I ain't no painted lady. Could I have a few words with you? We don't need no more hands on this drive, fella. We're almost to God. I don't want a job. I just want some information. All right. You ask the questions, but I ain't promising no answers. Fair enough. Can I tie my horse here? Sure. Just keep him out of the beans. I'm looking for a man named Tom Haskett. Oh? I heard he was with your outfit. Is that a fact? I'd like very much to find him. We haven't seen each other since the war. Is he on this drive? Well, why don't you hang around and find out, mister? Well, I could do that, of course, but... Well, to tell the truth, I'd like to surprise him. Well, now, ain't that pretty? I know it may sound strange, but... I don't think he ever expected to see me again. Oh. And I'd like to work it so our meeting is... is sort of private. <laughs> There ain't much privacy out here on the plains, mister. Well, you could help me if you would. Well, what do you want me to do? Uh, over at that creek bed where those bushes are. I, I thought I might wait for him over there, and then you could send him over when he gets back to camp. Well, now, why should I? I'd be glad to supply a little something to wash the dust down your throat. Oh? Uh, drinking whiskey? Drinking whiskey. It's in my saddlebag. Okay, mister. And it don't make much sense to me, but I'll speak to Haskett when he comes in for his supper. I'll be waiting. Been a long time. Somebody want to see me? You Tom Haskett? Yeah, I'm Haskett. Over here. What's on your mind, mister? Cook said you wanted to see me. I thought you'd remember me. I know you? You ought to. Maybe I can jog your memory. You remember Manassas? Second bull run? You bet I do. Was you there, too? I was there. You sound like a reb. I was a Confederate cavalryman. Hey, hold on a minute. You remember a string bed just about like this, and you lying there wounded, firing yeah. as we advanced? And my gun jammed, and you could have picked me off easy, but you didn't? <laughs> You're a groat. That's right, Haskett. Yancey Groat. Well, I'll be dogged. Didn't figure on seeing me again. Did no, you? for a fact I didn't, but I'm right glad to meet with you. I'm proud of the chance to shake your hand. That's not why I came here. You want me to do something for you? Need money or, or, or a job? Be proud to do anything I can. That won't be necessary. Well, then... I'm going to kill you, Haskett. It's a poor joke. I held this gun on you once before and let you live. I will not make that mistake again. You must be crazy. Maybe. Maybe a man goes crazy thinking about his house burning down, his wife dying, and the man who did it Sure. Sure, it's a terrible thing. What's it got to do with me? You can stand there with the memory of that fire showing in your eyes and ask me a question like that. Well, now, listen a minute, You and bro. your men on that march with Sherman, burning, looting, harming innocent you women. You mean down in Georgia? I mean just outside Atlanta. Well, now, listen to me, Groat. Now, I was never in Georgia in my life. Not before the war, not during, not after. That's not what your sergeant said, Haskett. My sergeant? He identified you all right. Lieutenant Tom Haskett, he said. That's you, ain't it? Well, sure, that's me. But I'm not the one you're after. Listen, man, I can prove it. I was in prison. Burning I a w- man's house, killing his wife. 
After his life had been saved? Look, he... Shooting's he, too good for you, Hank. Roach, you got to give me a chance. I gave you one with the same gun in for my the hand. the sake of hey, hands, Roach. No, no. You... You drop didn't it, have... Roach. You're too late, Marshal. I said drop it. Pick it up, Chester. Is this Haskett? That's Haskett. But you're too late, Marshal. Haskett? Mm. Can you hear me? He's crazy. He's stark crazy. Chester. Yes, sir. Get over to the cattle camp and borrow a wagon. We gotta get this man to dock. Yes, Mr. You save his life, I'll just get him again. I don't think you're going to have the chance, Grote, one way or the other. Hold up, Chester. There's Doc across the street. Yes, sir. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc. Come over here, will you? Oh, yes, sure, Matt. Nobody can help him. You just sit quiet, Grote. Uh, what is it, Matt? Doc, we got a badly wounded man in the wagon. Thought you ought to take a look at him before we moved him up to your office. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, help me up, will you, Chester? Sure, Doc. Give me a hand. Yeah. Hey. Thank you, Chester. Now then, you just lie still. Let me see. Easy, easy now. Uh, It'll just be a minute. What do you think, Doc? He's not good, man. Not good. Doc. Doc. Uh, We'll do what we can now, but just easy easy now. You're Doc Adams. That's my name. Don't you remember me? Uh, No, but it doesn't matter. Now, don't you worry about it. It does matter. Look. Look at me, Doc. I'm... Tom Haskett. Now, don't try to talk. You think... You've got to remember... Libby Prison, Doc. Remember Libby Prison. Sure, now, sure. I, I was there long enough, but you've got to be quiet. Look at my right eye. Scarred. Scarred? Well, let me see. You tell him, Doc. Tell him I was there. Why? Why, I believe you're right. You mean you do remember him, Doc? Why? Yes, Matt, I believe I do. I, I might forget his face, but I could never forget that scar. I worked hard to save that eye. Now, he was in Libby prison with you? Yes. Yes, he was. Right up to the end of the war. And he couldn't have been with Sherman in Georgia. I just said we were in Libby, didn't I? Grote. Did you hear that? I made a mistake. You can just bet you did. You spend years of your life planning a killing and then end up shooting the wrong man. I saved his life once, Marshal. You canceled that score, Groot. What do you mean? He's dead. I... I didn't mean... You lived your whole life just planning this thing. Ever since the war. There's just one thing about it. What's that, man? At least another part of the war is over. But like most wars, it ended too late. stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. The story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Marion Clark, with editorial supervision by John Meston. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Jess Kirkpatrick, and Frank Cady. Harley Bear is Chester, Howard McNear is Doc, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. This is George Walsh inviting you to join us again next week for another story on Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke.